Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, the beauty of innocent children, right? <laughs> and the opportunity for le learning. That's important. That's wonderful. All right. Well, now we'll have the scripture reading, and Caleb will do the scripture reading for us. So the scripture reading today will be 1 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything, for they themselves declare concerning us what matter of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen. Well, <clears throat> well, this morning for service, uh, I was not sure exactly what to speak about. And then I saw the news and I saw the unrest and the uh, everything from injustice and indignancy to uh, uh, it just reminds me that the heart of man needs the Lord. And uh, you know, this world This world has a lot of complex problems. And so I asked the question this morning, what changes the world? Um, because there are problems. Sometimes they're 25 miles away in a different city. And sometimes they're 4,000 miles away in a desert somewhere. And sometimes it's in the, the room next door uh, that the world needs to change. And um, so this morning, re reflectively, I asked the question, uh, what changes the world? And uh, as I was putting the study together, I was trying to find the answer to that a little bit. And so I asked if death, does death change the world? And no, no, death does not change the world. You know, in 2008, in Washington State, there were more than 56, almost 57,000 deaths. And yet, Washington State just kept right on going, doing what it normally does. And uh, so, really, death doesn't change what the world is doing. So maybe life, does life change the world? You know, when I had children for the first time, it changed my world. And yet in Washington state in 2008, or excuse me, 2018, pardon me, there were 86,085 births. And life just continued even though there were 86,000 more blessed souls in the state of Washington, life just continued as normal. You know, that year 
worldwide, there were 360,000 people born. That means 15,000 babies are born every hour. If you think about it, by the time the church service is over, there's another 15,000 souls added on this planet. So the question is, does life change the world? Not really, not very much. It may change a little bit of what we think about, what we work for, how we interact, how we care for young people. And yet, really the only thing that can change the world is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can change the world. Because the Holy Spirit will direct us from the time we live till the time we die to work in this world. You know, there's a lot of unrest, a lot of demonstrations, a lot of finger pointing, a lot of cause and effect, a lot of rules versus uh, regulations, a lot of things that um, divide people. And um, really to get past that, we need a gift. We need a gift to get past uh, the anger of, of injustices or losses that we've experienced. And the only thing that, the only way we will receive that gift is through the Holy Spirit. That first gift is forgiveness. You know, when I was looking through, I, I was looking for quotes, and this is by Mark Twain. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. You know, I thought that's a very poignant phrase. You know, there's no, no thought that that flower uh, has ill feelings for anyone. That flower doesn't hide its gift either of smelling sweet. Forgiveness is the fragrance the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. That's a, that's a tall order. You know, if we think of ourselves, you know, forgiveness is a huge gift. It's a huge blessing. You know, when we first receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we repent, don't we? And we receive forgiveness. And that forgiveness uh, is a sweet fragrance. It's a beautiful gift. You know, even though we had trampled all over the law of God, broken his commandments, and yet that forgiveness, all those flowers that we had stomped on, that forgiveness was still available. Forgiveness and pardon. You know, as we receive forgiveness and we have that, that sweet smell from the flower that we just trampled, it makes us to look around and see what we've done, doesn't it? it makes us to see Maybe we won't step on it again. Maybe we won't ruin God's law, God's word on this next try. As we continue to walk, we'll watch for it and not crush. Really, in the world today, the only thing that we can move forward with is forgiveness. And that is a gift from the Holy Spirit. The scripture here in Psalms 130, verses 3 and 4, says, If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? 
but there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be healed. Psalms 103 and 4, 130 verses 3 and 4. I don't know about you, but I am unable to stand. <laughs> uh, if all of my iniquities were marked, I would be so utterly ashamed. And yet I praise the Lord for his forgiveness, for his goodness that has changed my life, changed who I am. And that forgiveness has given me new new effect in my life. You know, the Holy Spirit changes us by grace. And that grace is another part of the gift from the Holy Spirit. I found this quote here from Robert Louis Stevenson. It says, there is nothing but God's grace. We walk upon it. We breathe it. We live and die by it. It makes the nails and axles of the universe. You know, all things are upheld by the word of his power, aren't they? And the grace of God, that is what the world needs. That is the only way to move in a positive direction. Forgiveness giving one another grace. And if we realize that there is nothing else but grace, that we truly do walk in grace, that we truly do breathe every day by the grace of God. It helps us to see the world as it really is, a blessing. And not so much ours, but it is a gift from the Lord. You know, God is upholding all things by the word of his power. That's in Hebrews 1, verse 3. You know, if we see the world as God's mission field because all of it around us is grace, even if the worldlings don't see it that way, they don't see that they're walking in grace. But are they? Are the worldlings walking around today by the grace of God? They absolutely are. We absolutely are. And the world can be changed by God's grace. You know, there's a, an interesting scripture I saw here in the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 8. This is when they're back in Jerusalem and uh, under King Cyrus's order to rebuild and restore. It says, but now for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us as an escaped remnant, to give us a peg in his holy place, that our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. You know, that is so necessary. And not just, and not just every once in a while, but every day that we realize that we're living in grace. We're living, uh, and we need that reviving that God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. You know, those that are in, in bondage today, that's what they need. They need their eyes enlightened. And they need reviving in their spirit, in their soul, in their heart. You know, as a 40-something as a white male, it's hard for me to speak about a lot of race issues. And yet I understand that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord and there doesn't have to be this uh, chasm between brothers and sisters. And yet the enemy has made 
inroads uh, into the family, into the communities, all of these places to rebuild and to restore, we need God's grace. We need God's mercy. We need God's forgiveness. You know, grace is unmerited favor, isn't it? We're given grace and even though we don't deserve it, God has, has made a way to improve and to watch over uh, what we are, are doing and how we are, are uh, how we are in our daily life. You know, the other side to that is mercy. You know, mercy is not getting the punishment we deserve. And this quote here, I have always found that mercy bears richer fruits than strict justice. You know, as I've seen demonstrations and police officers kneeling and, and, and people pouring their emotions and their hearts out to one another, it's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing to be able to give mercy to each other. And yet, on that human level, we realize that God, God has mercy even deeper, broader, wider for us. You know, mercy has changed the world. Does anyone get mad when others receive mercy? I think sometimes, sometimes they do. Did you know that mercy may be the best gift you can give to someone? Really, mercy can change your life. Mercy can change uh, the dynamic uh, of so many aspects in your life. Mercy can be the best gift that you can give to anyone. I'd like to look at this scripture here in Psalms 25. And I don't have the whole reference there. So if you'll turn with me. Psalms chapter 25. starting in verse 10. It says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. That's a beautiful promise, isn't it? All of the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. It's conditional, though, isn't it? To those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Continuing in verse 11. It says, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. You know, David here recognizes the, uh, the human condition, the soul of man. Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. In verse 12, who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He, sh he himself shall dwell in prosperity and his descendant shall inherit the earth. All of the paths of the Lord are mercy. You know, to think of mercy as keeping you from the trouble that we deserve. And yet as we follow his testimony, his covenant and his testimony, The Lord would have us to dwell in prosperity and to inherit the earth. We have something to look forward to, don't we? And thank the Lord for, for God's mercy. Hmm. 
mercy can and will change the world. But you know, mercy without kindness is missing something, isn't it? Hear this other quote from Mark Twain. Kindness is the language the deaf can hear and the blind can see. You know, kindness is a demonstration of what Christ wants to do for mankind. That's really what kindness is. Uh, kindness is not an idea, is it? Kindness is not an idea. Kindness is an action. Kindness is a, uh, kindness is a motivation. Kindness is a commitment, really, to those around us. A sister and brother to show them more care and consideration. You know, we need the Holy Spirit, that this kindness would be something that we don't even have to think about, but that we choose to do, that it is a, uh, an, out, it's an extension of who we are and how we minister uh, to others. I found this scripture in Isaiah. It says, with a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. You know, even though there is uh, offense, even though there is uh, error that we have done, the Lord's kindness comes back. Even after that moment. His kindness comes back to us. His everlasting kindness. With everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. You know, I have uh, a few coworkers, and, and I talk to them, and, and so we're talking about what's going on. And, and at our job site, we were to, to keep the gates closed and, and not allow other people to come in. And, and be vigilant because uh, protests could come right down the street. And yet, you know, my words were, you know, get right with the Lord because he's coming back soon. And one of my coworkers said, well, I just, I just got to go get my gun. And to think of the, uh, the loss of opportunity to think that way, to resort to, to violence rather than kindness, to resort to uh, self-defense rather than mercy. Um, that's what the world is up against. You know, each, each of us do have inalienable rights, and yet, Mercy is needed. Kindness is needed. If we are ever to get past uh, these, these problems that the world has right now, with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you. What a beautiful gift for those that have the hope of salvation and are not thinking carnally about defending themselves with weapons or defending themselves against injustice by violence. It's a completely different mindset. And yet it is so far superior to the human remedy. Everlasting kindness and mercy. I'd like to look a little bit farther in uh, 
Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 8. I'd like to read through to verse 10. If you'd like to turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 54, 8 through 10. It says, with a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. You know, natural disasters and things are coming upon this planet. And yet, God's kindness will not depart from you. And he will have mercy on you, on, on, on those that love him. You know, our kindness should be an extension of God to man. Because that's what, that's what is needed in this world today. Kindness. Kindness is not an idea. It's an action. It's an opportunity to do for people what God wants to do for them. Kindness, showing love. You know, love is a, comp it's a complex word. And yet, I wanted to look at agape love. Because that's the finest representation of the love that God has for men. It says, agape is something of the understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It is a love that seeks nothing in return. It is an overflowing love. It's what theologians would call the love of God working in the lives of men. And when you rise to love on this level, you begin to love men not because they are likable, but because God loves them. You know, we think of what the world needs. Well, we need it first, the Holy Spirit. We need this agape love, this overflowing love, this understanding goodwill for men, this creative goodwill for men a redemptive goodwill for men and not because they're likable because God loves them. So this is a very important aspect. We can give forgiveness. We can give mercy and grace. And in this kindness and love, there's, there's a goodwill that these people would receive. Not because they're likable, but because God loves them. God loves them so much. And wants to overcome the, the delusion of their current situation. Because force and uh, Anger and um, outrage, those will continue to the end of time. But they are not what will bring healing, what will bring lasting and formative change in the life. Do we share understanding goodwill? 
Do we share creative goodwill? That's what God does for us. Did you know that? God shares a creative goodwill for you and for me. God shares that redemptive goodwill for you and for me. And God, God does that even though it's not reciprocated. It's not returned. And that's a tall order for us humanly to do, to love that way, even though it's not reciprocated or returned in life. We're to love people because God loves them. That is truly a gift from the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It's an evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts and our minds. To have a creative goodwill for other people. But love will build our faith. I found a a quote here from Martin Luther that was a huge blessing. You know, he understood righteousness by faith. Here his quote says, At last meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I begin to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. What a beautiful quote. You know, to think of realizing God's righteousness is available by faith. God's robe of covering is available by faith. that true gift of God, given. What, what a huge blessing. And to realize that, yes, we are covered in the Lamb's robe of righteousness. By faith in Christ, we are covered. And not our own works. Christ works. You know, the faith of Luther changed the world. The faith of Luther and the word of God changed the world. The faith of Luther uh, was placed on a, an entirely new level, a new plane of the scripture and the scripture only, being the source of truth, the light or the path ahead, faith in the word of God, and then faith in the mercy and the righteousness of God being applied on yours and my account. The righteousness of God covering us, those that repent and confess their sins those sins being covered and washed away, never to return. What a beautiful gift that Martin Luther's faith changed the world. You know, we, we all too often forget about prayer. I was so thankful for the opportunity to be part of the, the 24 hours of prayer. And, uh, you know, I was still at work and had to tell my boss I had to step away for prayer. And uh, I, I don't remember a time I'd been more blessed in prayer. But what a gift, the, the ability to pray, the time to step away from being busy, the time from uh, just the monotony that this world can lead to, to be able to step away in prayer. The quote here from Watchman Nee, 
He lived in the, the 20s before the communist revolution in China. It says, obtaining an answer to prayer is not the highest goal of prayer. The purpose of prayer is that we be one with God's will so that God can work. What a beautiful gift that uh, we have an opportunity to take part in. And you don't even have to be in a certain place. That you, you can appeal to our Heavenly Father. You know, taking time in prayer will improve every situation. <laughs> That's a beautiful gift, isn't it? Taking time in prayer will improve every situation. When we pray, the Holy Spirit we pray and ask for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can give us these things that would change the world. Forgiveness, grace, mercy, kindness, love, and faith. You know, when we have those things, the world looks totally different to us. You know, the reasons why we pray are different as well. The reasons what we pray for, they are different because the Holy Spirit gives us understanding on how we should pray. And as we are blessed to have the Holy Spirit and these tokens or these uh, blessings were given the opportunity for service. Here in the Ministry of Healing, it says, Every human being is the object of loving interest to him who gave his life, that he might bring men back to God. Souls guilty and helpless. excuse me, liable to be destroyed by the arts and snares of Satan, are cared for as a shepherd cares for the sheep of his flock. Now this here says every human being. Every human being cared for. And I pray that we will be part of that service. You know, the Holy Spirit can equip us and prepare us for specific service. Each of us are in a different sphere of influence. Each of us have different customers. Each of us have different family members. Each of us have different neighbors. But every human being is the object of loving interest to God and are cared for as a shepherd cares for the sheep of his flock. We have an important work to do. You know, as we think about what changes the world, you know, sometimes we don't think that what we do is very earth changing, worldwide changing, and yet, it's there, it's important. It is very important what we do for our brothers and our sisters and for those around us. Matthew 25, 40, the king will reply, tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. You know, I don't have the answers for all of the problems but the Holy Spirit does. And as we are able to interact with those around us, the Holy Spirit can quicken our minds and give us the scripture, uh, uh, the word of truth to apply to the situation. So I pray that as we 
serve as we pray for, ask for the Holy Spirit to give us these precious steps that can change the world. Even if it's not worldwide, it's eternity wide to think of the change that can come when one sinner repents. Eternity is improved. And so we have been given, uh, we're entrusted with a, a beautiful opportunity, a beautiful gift to help and change someone's heart and mind. So I pray that as we continue through the week ahead, that um, prayerfully we can think about how can we change the world?